Galatians chapter 4. All right. Here's some Q&A for you. How many of you have either watched or read C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Most everyone, looks like. Good. Now, next question. Is this story fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. Good, it's fiction. And does C.S. Lewis make all this material up just out of thin air, or is it based on something? Based on what? Hey? Okay. The Bible. It's based on Bible, right? His inspiration for writing this fictitious story is based on God's Word. Now, what's the style of his storytelling called? What category would, you, would it fall under? It's called allegorization, right? The, sto- the style in creating is allegory, and in his book, C.S. Lewis draws from Christian themes and characters found in the Bible. So I just thought it would be fun to let's take a look at a few of these characters and see their symbolism here. Of course, Aslan the lion, we're familiar with that. Who would he represent? Jesus, right. He's strong, he reigns as king of the land, but then voluntarily he lays down his life for Edmund on the stone table. And this, of course, it parallels the crucifixion of Jesus. Then, Aslan, of course, is resurrected, just like Jesus. When he, became, he was victorious over sin and death, and then who else? There's several characters. We have the White Witch. Now, she represents uh, evil, sin, even Satan. She rules Narnia with a cruel hand, bringing perpetual winter. You know, this is symbolizing what? Death and despair. She turns creatures into stone, much like how sin hardens hearts. And her eventual defeat represents the triumph over good and evil. And then there's more characters. There was Edmund, like I mentioned, and he represents the fallibility of man and just how susceptible we are to temptation. Do you remember what he did? He betrayed his siblings for Turkish delight. I I don't really like Turkish delight. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't have done that for Turkish delight. But who does this represent? I mean, this is symbolic of even when Judas betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. So that's Edmund. And then, of course, Peter. Peter, the elder brother, he's brave, he's strong, and he represents, of course, the apostle Peter and other Christian leaders in the faith. His bravery and leadership in battle against the forces of the evil witch, and this echoes the role of the faithful. And this is strong leadership found in the Bible, as seen in Peter. And then there's the middle sister, Susan. It's all coming back to you now, isn't it? Now that you've, you've, we're in the story, we're deep in the story. Susan represents practical faith, and then there's some caution there. Her nurturing nature and skepticism is symbolic of, of those who struggle with faith, but still play a crucial role in the community of believers. And then there's Lucy, sweet little Lucy, and she represents pure faith and innocence. Her unwavering belief in Narnia and, of course, Aslan, even when others were doubting her, this symbolizes this childlike faith in Christianity. Lucy's ability to see Aslan when no one else could reflects the blessing found in the Beatitudes of those who are pure in heart. Now, there's many other characters, and, but that's enough. I mean, you, there's even Mr. Uh, Tumnus, right? He's the fawn. So there's all sorts of characters which reflect various things in Scripture. But why do I bring all this up? It's allegory. It's allegory. And 
we've noticed the words like symbolism and parallelism and representative and even type and archetype. We're going to have that today in the portion of Galatians that we're going through. So now we know what it means to have an allegory. Now, Clint, you're going to find this out. When the first things you do when you go to seminary, one of the, right around the first classes you take, it's hermeneutics. And the first thing they teach you in hermeneutics is never to interpret scripture using allegory. But there is one person who can get away with it. Well, there's more than one. There's the Apostle Paul, because obviously he writes it here. And then there's, of course, Jesus Christ. He used allegory quite often, right? You remember the, the I'm the vine and you are the branches? This is also an example of allegory, all right? But that's why we here at FBC, we hold to a hermeneutic that is literal, historical, and grammatical. I mean, we always endeavor to find what was the author's original intent. We ask all the appropriate questions, like, who's the author? Who is the audience? What were the circumstances at the time? And what was the context of everything that was taking place at the time of writing? And then we unpack it during our, our expository preaching and our exegesis, but the application, then, is what's different. The application is what's contemporary, it's what's personal, and it's for us today. But you have to know that there is a big difference between interpretation and application. Very different things. And I bring all this up, again, because of what we're looking at today in Galatians chapter 4. So we're finishing up the chapter, Lord willing. We've got ten verses. We're going to have to really rush through it a bit. But Paul gives the Galatian believers a reminder, and he does so, and he even tells us it's in the form of an allegory, and that those who hear it should take that to heart. I'm writing to you, and I'm sharing with you an allegory. He does this in three stage, stages of the message. The first is historical. The second is allegorical, and the third is personal. Historical, allegorical, and personal. And these will be our outline points as we go through our text this morning. Paul again speaks about the Mosaic Law, as he's done often in the letter. And he also speaks about who are the true sons of Abraham. And what I find helpful is, again, Paul's just stating, this is allegory, guys. This is allegory. Treated as such, he's not reinterpreting Genesis. He's not giving us a new, fresh word. That's not what he's doing. When we look at Genesis, we'll see that. So keep that in mind as we read our passage. Galatians 4, verses 21 to 31. And afterwards, we'll pray. Galatians 4, 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law... Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate, one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Verse 28, now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we're not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Let's pray. 
Our Lord, our God, and our Heavenly Father, as always, it is a, such a great pleasure to come before you and your holy throne in prayer. And we as a body of believers, we count it a privilege and a blessing to sit under the preaching of your word. And our request is that you would speak to us through this portion of Galatians. That your Holy Spirit would enable us to take to heart the truths found in the text. We haven't come this morning to be entertained, simply to socialize or to, to see and be seen. We as a body of believers have assembled together out of obedience to your word. To be changed by the instruction in your word. These are the words of eternal life. Lord, I pray you'd help me as I... This is a somewhat difficult passage to navigate. Give me wisdom from on high. and It's my desire to articulate, Lord, your word with clarity. The meaning you intended your people to understand. And I repeat what we so often pray. Allow us to leave here different than when we arrived. Shape us, fashion us into your likeness through the conformity to the truths found here in Scripture. And all the means of grace which we participate in while here, this is just a sweet time of fellowship, of worshiping you, song, worshiping you through our giving, worshiping you through our praying, and of course now through the preaching of your word and obedience to what we learn from your word. We give you all praise. We give you much thanks in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as we've gone through Galatians, we continue to glean from the text that the Judaizers are boasting in the fact that they are the true sons of Abraham. And the Galatians, well, essentially, you're not. They're saying they're made to feel and they're led to believe that they're just on the outside looking in as people who claim to be believers in God. But because they do not have the law, they're essentially they're lacking. That's the Judaizers message. They're on the outside. So let's begin with verse 21 and Paul's historical approach. Tell me you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? So here, Paul's challenging the Galatians with the entirety of the Old Covenant. All of the Old Testament. He's reminding them, guys, it's all or nothing. There's no salvation by grace through faith, faith with the cherry on top being you can have some of the law. That's just not how it works. There's not just a little bit of the law that you can abide by and still be saved by grace through faith. Should it be that a person finds themselves relying on any part of the law for any of their salvation, then you've now adopted a whole works-based religion. Paul's saying you cannot do that. You live by the law, you die by the law. There's no picking and choosing. We're under the new covenant now. He continues the historical lesson in verses 22 and 23. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman, but the one of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now Abraham fathered more than two sons. He had several, but Scripture places emphasis mostly on these first two which he fathered. And because these two sons had different mothers, we, of course, we have a problem. The firstborn son, technically, was Ishmael, right? However, he was illegitimate. He was the child of a slave woman, born according to the flesh. The second child, Isaac, was born to Abraham by Sarah. This is through natural means. And she was a free woman, and Sarah was Abraham's proper wife. 
Here Paul's laying down the foundation for his argument of our text this morning. He says, if you procreate and beget offspring by a slave woman, you beget a child that's a slave child. If you procreate with your natural wife, who's a free woman, you beget the child that God intended. Who's not the child of slavery or bondage, this would be the child of of promise. So let's quickly review the Genesis accounts. And keep in mind, in the first books of the Bible, the people generally tended to live longer than we do today. But go ahead and turn with me to Genesis in chapter 12. Keep a, a ribbon in Galatians. We'll come back there in a few minutes. Genesis 12. And this is a, Abraham's original call by Yahweh. And we, we studied this earlier in Galatians. I'd also like you to take note as I read these few verses, how many uh, I will, I will, God says, I will. Listen to this. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram. Now also I'm going to be saying Abram and Abraham, Sarah and Sarai, and it won't necessarily be at the right times, but give me some grace. Flow with it. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now you'd think if God is going to make a man into a great nation, this man would need to provide, I mean, he would have to have a wife, a bountiful wife who would be able to give him lots of kids. Well, Abraham here is 75 years old when the promise is first given. And the ideal window for childbirth for he and his wife, well, the ship has sailed. That's what, that's what we're reading here. That window is closed. Now let's fast forward over to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 15. And God further promises blessings to Abram. For all the land that you see, I'll give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Okay, now flip over to Genesis 15. Continuing on. Genesis chapter 15. The word of the Lord came to Abraham and he said, Fear not, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham said, and I'm paraphrasing, Lord, what good is a reward unless it's from the fruit of my loom? Wait, I have no offspring. And now some servant, some hired hand, is, going to, is supposed to be my heir? And the Lord said, no, no. Your very own son will be your heir. Just be patient. Just be patient, Abraham. Hang in there. The Lord took Abram and said, come. Took him outside. Look to the heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. I mean, this is the, the famous Abraham's faith counted as righteousness verse. Fast forward, Genesis 16. Genesis 16, 1 to 6. Now something happened to Abraham's faith. It was counted to him as righteousness, but it, it, it must not have stuck around. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord. Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. <clears throat> now guys, whenever your wife says, starts a sentence in this way. Behold now. <laughs> Behold now the Lord. 
I mean, you guys, you usually sit up or, or, and pay attention. And so did Abram. But he shouldn't have. Look at the text. Go into my servant, and it may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now, Abram's 85 years old and childless. He has no idea where this heir is coming from. It's time to get creative and help God out. That's what they're thinking. And after all, it's his wife's idea, right? So you, you can see how Abram's thinking here. Abram listened to the voice of his wife, Sarah. Bad move. Bad move. It reminds me of another time when a man in Genesis listened to his wife, a few chapters earlier. Right? Adam and Eve's punishment from Genesis 3, same story. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, the ground is now cursed, and you shall be cursed, and you'll have to toil and sweat for your food all the feeble days of your life. Because you listen to your wife. Now, guys, listening to your wife's not a bad thing unless it leads to sin. Okay, that's the difference. That's the difference. All right, now let's fast forward again to Genesis 17, 15. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 15. God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless Sarah by giving her a child through you. This time, verse 17, remember last time he believed the Lord. This time Abraham fell on his face laughed and said to himself, can a hundred-year-old bear a son? Really? Oh, that, look, we've got Ishmael. Oh, that Ishmael would be my heir. God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an ever Lasting covenants. In chapter 21, this promised son, Isaac, is eventually born. But what a roller coaster ride! What a ride of faith and then of failure, too. Just as he promised 25 years earlier, Genesis 12, that promised son eventually gets to be. So now we have the son of a slave a problem, and the son of promise. These are the two sons. So now we're in verses 24. You can go ahead and flip back. We're in verses 24 to 27 of Galatians, and we're looking at Paul's allegory. And Paul starts out by saying, this must be interpreted as allegory. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. And now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Again, Paul here is not pretending to know a more true and deeper meaning from the Genesis text. And what, what, what's really being said about these two women. He's not giving us that. He's giving an analogy. Being inspired and superintended by the Holy Spirit, Paul simply says, guys, allow me to paint a picture for you. I'm, 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 I'm not negotiating, but I'm trying to persuade you, Galatians, in several different ways. And now I'm going to paint a picture for you. We have before us two women, two sons, to Jerusalem, and two covenants. The two sons with their mothers represent two religions. One is a religion of bondage, which is Judaism, and a religion of freedom, which is Christianity. And we cannot understand the Christian faith well unless we understand these two covenants. Because isn't that what the entirety of our Bible is? Old covenant and new? Old and New Testaments. So a covenant is a vow from God to man. 
by which he makes them his people and promises them to be their God. God initiated both of the covenants himself, old and new. The old was established by promises given to Abraham and through the law of Moses. The new was established by promises given through Jesus and made possible by his sin-free life and then, of course, laying down that life. Paul's message throughout the letter is consistent. Salvation is of God alone and, of course, by God faith alone, and through grace alone, the law was never intended to make man righteous. He's pleading with the Galatians. Its purpose, when we've looked at this numerous times, the law's purpose was to allow them to recognize their need for a Savior, that they could understand they'll never, ever fulfill the law in its entirety. And that's what you have to do if you're going to live by the law. Man must know they are in desperate need of a Savior. And there's just, there's just no combination of those two. You cannot combine the two. You cannot mix law with grace. These two women are symbolic of the two covenants. The slave woman, Hagar, represents the law because all those who were under it were enslaved by it. And you recall, we looked at this in great detail in Galatians chapter 3, how the law was our tutor, or the law was our schoolmaster, remember? Now Hagar, the slave woman, represents the law in Paul's picture. She represents, excuse me, represents Mount Sinai, which is in fact, remember, where the law was given by God to Moses. And this in Paul's allegory it further represents Jerusalem. Let's take a look at how. I and mean, it still does to this day. Jerusalem represents Judaism. And it does, and it always has been, that Israel and Jerusalem is the heart, the Jewish heart of the religion. And its capital is J Jerusalem of the whole entire Israeli nation. In verse 25 Hagar, the slave woman, and her children correspond with all things that are law-related or works-based. She and her offspring symbolize, remember how their son came about? By the flesh. Man-made things, man-made religion, man-made efforts. We see this in Sarah and Abraham's desperate attempt to produce an heir in their own strength, in the flesh. They did not wait patiently on the promises of God. They tried to fulfill them by their own efforts, believing, remember, God just needed a little help, a little helping hand. They were just going to get the ball rolling. So whenever we talk about the patriarchs and the Old Testament, we have to, I would like to pause because Quite often we have some questions rumbling around in the back of our minds. So I just thought I'd address these. Genesis 16.3. We read that Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to her husband, Abram. Here you go. Here's your wife, Sarah said. Now God didn't give Abraham a second wife. Sarah gave her husband her Egyptian slave, and they justified their faithless act by saying, oh, let's call her your wife. Okay? How does God refer to Hagar and the son of Hagar in Scripture? Genesis 21, we read in verses 12 and 13. God refers to her not as Abram's second wife. He refers to her as the slave woman. God refers to Ishmael as the son of a slave woman. I mean, we are so good at justifying our sin, are we not? We can categorize it under a different name. Oh, she's your wife. Give it a dignified appearance and, and, and just try to make it presentable. But it's sin. 
It's sin. There's no amount of dressing up sin to where God says, oh, okay, two wives, okay, now that's fine. No, that's not how God sees it. It's sin. Sin is sin. Ishmael was the son of sin from a faithless act of sin and not the son of promise. When the patriarchs engaged in polygamy, it was always sin. Never God ordained. And I've heard the stories, we've all heard the stories over, over the, the generations. Well, polygamy, you know, shame. When, when there's three times the amount of women than there are men, then I'm sure it's justified. No, it's not. That's not God's plan. Or we're in Africa. Well, you know, for the, for the Africans to be subsistent farmers, and they needed to have a few wives so they could have more children, and then the workload could be spread equally, and then, well, then they could survive. That's rubbish. That's not God's plan for man. One man, one woman. That's God's plan. That's what Scripture tells us. Genesis 21, 13, and verse 18, God consoles Hagar by saying, Don't worry, I, I still will make a great nation out of your son, Ishmael. Now, how has the world historically referred to this nation of Ishmael? He's the father of the Arab nation, right? As does the, the, the religion of Islam counts Ishmael as their father, as a great prophet even, supposed. And that Islam as a religion even refers back to Abraham as their father. And now this is the point of Paul's story. All the people calling Abraham their father presents a problem. Paul's allegory is still quite accurate since he's using the slave woman and her son as an example of bondage and symbolic of what is produced through self-effort. Instead of trusting in God's perfect plan and waiting for God to bring about his promise. Sarah was Abraham's first and lawful and God-ordained natural wife. And God promised them a son, but this was only to come in God's perfect timing. And when Isaac finally arrived on the scene, there was no doubt that was a supernatural act of God. That was 100% his provision. And that's how God wanted it to seem. Appear. It was a gift from God. He was the promised heir. Not the illegitimate child of an adulterous affair with a slave woman. So in the allegory, Isaac, the son of promise, represents religion of freedom. It represents us. The Christian faith. So the natural and God-honoring relations between Abraham and his wife, Sarah, in time, produced the promised child, who in the allegory represents good, all that's good, all that's proper, all that's God-ordained. Isaac was the son of faith. Isaac was the son of promise, not the unnatural forced son of a slave woman. So God's provision through Sarah and Isaac are symbolic of the new covenant and the Christian church and the new Jerusalem. Now that's interesting, the new Jerusalem. What does Paul mean by saying this in verse 26? The Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Why describe Jerusalem as our mother? Well, again, because in Paul's allegory, claiming... Abraham as father, it's sort of diluted now, the meaning and the significance of Abraham as father. So we look at the mother. Remember, all of Islam is claiming Abraham as father as well. Father Abraham took matters into his own hands and fathered many nations out of disobedience and a lack of faith. His physical bloodline has been diluted. So he's, Paul's using another angle to try and reason here with the Galatians. 
and as they, as believers, to try and help them just to tune out what the Judaizers were doing, just to block out their message, their false message. So when the Judaizers say, sure, you can believe in Jesus as Lord, but if you want Abraham as your father, then you need to follow the law. Otherwise, your faith is incomplete, and you're, you're just lacking, and you're still on the outside looking in. You're almost there. You just need to add the law. Paul's reminding them that Abraham and the law cannot save. Salvation is found in Christ alone. The Mosaic Law is the old covenant symbolic of existing Jerusalem. But the new Jerusalem is symbolic of the promised heir, the new covenant, and salvation which is made possible through Jesus Christ. Now, Jared read to us earlier Revelation 21. I just want to go back there and I want to hit some of the highlights of that chapter because the new Jerusalem is amazing. Amazing. Revelation 21. Come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carries me away. This is John. Carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. This is that new Jerusalem. Having the glory of God. It's radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Now it had great high walls. Now how many of you are from Gauteng, right? It had great high walls. You guys are going to feel at home here. I, maybe this is heaven for, for Jeru, you know, Joburg people. It had great high walls with 12 gates, and the, the gates, 12 angels. The wall was built of jasper. city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. There was jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, 11th, hyacinth, 12th, amethyst, and the 12 gates were entire pearls. How incredible. Each of the gates was made of one single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord. How cool is this? The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need for a sun or moon. Why? Because the glory of God gives its light. Its lamp is the Lamb. And by its light, the nations, pay attention to that, the nations, that's everyone, will walk. Because salvation is made available to all people. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut. Now that's a little bit different to Joburg. So we have the high walls, but we never close our gates. So I was thinking about this. Maybe the high walls, because all of this incredible, precious jewels were adorned on the high walls. So obviously these walls are just there to display God's glory and this incredible artwork. It's beautiful. So the gates are never closed. And there will be no night. They will bring it into the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does anything detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What an incredible... This is what we have to look forward to. How spectacular this will be. Now, in Paul's allegory, we see the rightful wife, the promised heir, the new covenant, and this new Jerusalem. As opposed to the forced relationship of a slave wife with an illegitimate slave son, that's the old covenant, and that's the Jewish law, Jerusalem. So Paul's making the case that you cannot mix old and new. Don't do it. It's not possible. You cannot be a new creation in Christ in order from... You know, being a new believer, being in Christ, saved by grace through faith, you cannot order off the a la carte menu of the Old Testament. That's what, they're, that's what the Judaizers are saying you must do. That's not freedom. 
It's enslavement. Going back to the law. Paul's saying you don't get circumcised. Don't observe certain feasts. Don't follow certain dietary restrictions. And still claim to be free in Christ. So let's wrap up this with the next few verses, verses 28 to 31. And we're, we're moving now, we're transitioning into Paul's personal stage. The personal stage in verse 28. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as that, that time he was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. What does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Brothers, we are not the children of the slave, but of the free woman. Paul wants the followers of Christ to apply this allegory to themselves. If you're in Christ, you're free like Isaac. You're not enslaved like Ishmael. We see from Genesis 21.9 that when Isaac was weaned, his parents threw a great big celebration. But now Ishmael at this point was a teenager, and Sarah saw that Ishmael was jeering and mocking the rightful heir. And most scholars even go as far to say that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. In fact, in verse 29, Paul uses that to describe it. Persecution. So what should we expect? We, who are heirs of promise, who take after Isaac. What should we expect? Well, Paul says this persecution still happens today. For the Galatians, it was the law pushing Judaizers. Their false teaching was so heretical that it was seen as a type of persecution. But for us today, it can easily be seen uh, that Ishmael's descendants want to put an end to Judaism and want to put an end to Christianity. I mean, we see it all over. We know what's happening in the Middle East now, in the Holy Land, that war. We see it just a few countries north of us, even in Mozambique. These extremists will stop at nothing to put an end to the truth, to freedom. But Christians are Abraham's true seed. Followers of Christ will inherit the blessing promised to his descendants. Now, given our hermeneutic that we mentioned before, literal, historical, grammatical, it's not our practice to spiritualize Old Testament promises. But many are fulfilled today in Christ in the people of Christ, in all who believe, and not physically in and through the Jewish nation during the present, this present, church age of grace. But there will come a day, we know this, there will come a day when the Lord will once again lift off the blinders that are over the, his chosen people Israel. And they will be given eyes to see and ears to hear. And they will be brought to faith and repentance. And we pray for that day. We long for that day. But that day is not now. Not yet. I think in Paul's letter to the Romans, he condenses much of the thrust of today's message in two verses. And it comes from Romans 8. 16 and 17, Paul says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Now, it's provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So what's our takeaway from all of this? It's an interesting allegory that Paul gives. What's our takeaway? Well, slavish law observance, as if this were the pathway to salvation, makes one similar to the slave son, makes one in the camp of Ishmael. Or perhaps 
there's a lack of joy. And you're just going through the motions as kind of a means to an end. Well, that's not a personal, vibrant relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you have the Spirit of the living God indwelling you. A source and an enabling for life and godliness. Make use of that. Rejoice that the Spirit of God dwells within you and enables you. Christians are true sons and daughters of Abraham. Christians, you are free in Christ. You are the rightful heirs. We have the new Jerusalem to look forward to. Cannot wait. But your daily Christian life, your walk, should demonstrate this. You should be putting on display love and joy and peace and patience and kindness as the rightful heirs and the children of promise. Amen? Good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, we so often think that you saved us because we had something worth saving. We had, we had done something to ourselves and, and, and had some redeemable quality about us. As if we got ourselves to the point of being worthy to be saved through some effort of our own. And that's just not the case. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every man, woman, and child from every tribe, tongue, and nation is created by you and in your image. And this alone is what qualifies us for redemption. And now that you've showed us this truth, now that you've saved us, and we who were once far off, you've brought us near. Would you help us to live our lives as heirs to live as sons and daughters, the rightful heirs of the, as children of the promise. We're no longer slaves to sin. For you have broken those shackles, enabling us to walk in the light of Christ, to walk in love, to walk in righteousness. Oh, Lord, we praise you. And as a body of believers, we commit to shine your light forth to proclaim this gospel truth to all the world for your glory, the glory of Christ, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.